Well, we're good. Good morning. I'm Jeff Hammond, Executive Director at International Ground Source Heat Pump Association. Thank you for joining us for our June Dig Deeper. We're thrilled to have Kevin Austin from Water Furnace this morning as our speaker. And we thank Water Furnace for sponsoring this Dig Deeper session. If you'd like to sponsor a town hall or a Dig Deeper, go to the EGSPA website and you'll find out more information. Before we get kicked off with Kevin's presentation, I have just some a uh, few slides with news and uh, I'll go through those just to keep you up to date with what's going on with uh, the International Ground Source Heat Pump Association. All right, so we're lucky to have a lot of presentations this year. In fact, we filled all of the town hall and dig deeper spots, but if you'd like to submit an abstract, uh, we are looking at 2024 already. Just go to the IGSPA website, to the events and training menu, and you'll find a form that looks just like this on my screen. So you can submit that for 2024. If you'd like to sponsor Town Hall or Dig Deeper webinars, same location, and just click on the link below that. Happy to say that uh, the, the conference in December is going well. We've had a lot of abstract submissions for presenters, over 75, in fact. So we are going to have just a great program this year with four tracks. And if you haven't registered already, go to igspa.org. You'll see a button for the conference right on the home page, or you can go to the menu. We also have a lot of exhibitors already, and we're filling up sponsorships and advertising opportunities. So, so don't wait, even though it sounds like it's far away in December, uh, things are going to happen pretty quickly. You can see we already have quite a few sponsors, uh, and we have just a few spaces left. We have our diamond sponsorship available, one gold sponsorship, one silver, and two bronze. All the others are filled. So if you'd like to sponsor the conference, uh, you'll want to do that here pretty quickly. These are the exhibitors we have so far. You can see a pretty good-sized block uh, has already reserved, and these booths can be reconfigured. So if you'd like a 20 by 20 or a 10 by 20, uh, that, that's certainly uh, possible, or a 10 by 10 with the way it's already set up. Just for your information, the doors are over here to the right and also right in this location. So at 10 o'clock when the doors open, uh, both this one here and the other one will be open. So the crowds will go through this direction, hopefully, and, um, and your exposure to attendees will be great uh, if, you, if you've got one of these uh, booths simply because of the location uh, in the exhibit hall. We still have program guide advertising opportunities, quarter, half, and full page, plus there's an inside front cover and a back cover still available. Same location, igspa.org, just check that out and you'll find all the details. Uh, the conference presenters abstract submissions was closed on May 31st. We're making decisions right now and we'll be notifying the speakers. So you should see an agenda coming up here in the next couple of weeks. And if you've submitted an abstract to speak at the conference, we'll be notifying you next week. Thank you so much for submitting that abstract. We're pretty excited about the topics we're gonna have. If you haven't heard, there's a research conference coming up in 2024. We're partnering with Polytechnic Montreal. It'll be May 28th through the 30th, uh, 2024 and it's on the campus of Polytechnic. So that will be um, the next research conference. Uh, we typically have those every couple of years. Uh, I do wanna make a note uh, as far as the mailing list. If you're not getting IGSPA uh, e emails, it may be because they're going into your junk or spam folder. So just a, a note here, there's a couple of screenshots that show um, if you're on a Mac or Windows, you'll want to add the IGSPA address. It's info at igspa.org. If you add that to your contacts, then those emails should come through. We have heard that some people are not getting the emails. That may be the reason they're being filtered out through spam or through, uh, through junk. We're happy to help you. If you have any questions on that, just drop us a note at info at igspa.org. For CEUs, for your renewals, your certification renewals, uh, you do get uh, credit for this Dig Deeper webinar and also for town halls. If you don't mind, please put your name and your email both in the chat and we'll gather those at the end of this presentation and make sure you get credit for these, uh, 
attendees for the attendance at these town halls and dig deepers. Just a little bit of housekeeping. If you don't mind, please put your question in the chat. I will be reading those at the end of Kevin's presentation. And uh, if we don't get to all of the questions, we'll follow up later on. But uh, hopefully we'll, we'll get a chance to get to just as many as possible. And for the courtesy of other attendees, please mute your microphone unless you're speaking. We will be recording this session if you didn't see that note earlier. And this will be uploaded to the IGSPA website. There's a YouTube icon at the very top. Usually takes a few days for it to get uploaded. Uh, so if you would check back maybe in the middle of next week and you'll see this presentation, just click on the YouTube icon at the very top of the igspa.org website and you'll find the Dig Deeper presentation for June. And one last item before I introduce our speaker. This is a disclaimer and potential conflict of interest that we read at every one of these webinars. The upcoming presentation represents the opinion of the presenter and does not represent any official position, opinion, or endorsement of any products or services by IGSPA or its members. IGSPA town halls and dig deeper webinars are for member updates and education on the latest information in the geothermal heat pump industry and are not meant to endorse one technology or brand over another. It is the presenter's responsibility to disclose any conflict of interest or position that may arise in the content of the webinar. And with that, I would love to introduce Kevin Austin of Water Furnace, who will be uh, our presenter today. We thank Water Furnace for sponsoring this Dig Deeper, and we look forward to an exciting presentation. Let me introduce Kevin uh, through this short bio, and then we'll move forward. Kevin Austin is a native of Chicago, Illinois, and currently lives in Kokomo, Indiana, with his wife, Jenny, and two sons. He has lived everywhere from Los Angeles to Boston, Houston to Chicago, and over a dozen places in between. Kevin spent eight years in the U.S. Navy, served aboard the USS Juno and USS Ranger, and traveled to 22 countries around the world. He brings 35 years of construction, manufacturing, and industrial experience with the latest, with the last 15 years, devoted exclusively to the geothermal industry. His drilling and loop installation experiences cover a wide range of projects and applications across the country. Kevin started his geothermal career as the first geothermal project manager of the nation's largest continuous geothermal project during the campus conversion of Ball State University in Muncie, Indiana from 2009 to 2011 while working for Ortman Drilling and Water Services. Kevin was hired for an estimated six months of ma to manage the first phase of Ball State and remained with Ort Ortman Drilling for nearly 14 years until joining Water Furnace International in 2022. Now as a ground heat exchanger loop consultant for Water Furnace, Kevin is focused on connecting all types of industry experts, including drillers, loop installers, contractors, architects, engineers, and various related industry partners across the US. Kevin is an IGSPA member of the training committee, an NGWA member, and has published in the Waterwell Journal, including a new article that's going to be published this July. He currently is working with Brock Yorty on a series of articles to be published in the Driller Magazine. And like most of us, Kevin is focused on awareness and training to promote and advance the geothermal industry. So with that, I turn it over to Kevin. If you would sh share your screen, Kevin, we'll be ready to go. Thanks so much. Thank you, Jeff. How's that look, Jeff? Looks great. You just need to go into uh, presentation mode, Kevin. Mm. That, that, that little button. Yeah, there we go. Perfect. We there? We're there. Outstanding. So good morning. Uh, I'd like to uh, welcome everyone to today's Expo webinar on GHX geothermal systems. Uh, as Jeff said, this uh, session is being recorded and um, I'm streaming live from Kokomo, Indiana, about an hour north of Indianapolis. Uh, this session will last for approximately four hours, and there will be a detailed test at the end, so I hope everyone's paying attention. Uh, in all seriousness, uh, this presentation will be approximately 40-45 minutes, uh, with time for Q&A at the end. 
and uh, feel free to uh, utilize the chat uh, on the uh, web page and uh, ask questions, uh, get those presented, and we'll answer those in the order we get them with the time we have left. Uh, today's presentation is a Geothermal 101, sort of an introductory course to types of geothermal applications and a detailed outline for before, during, and after steps to ensure a safe and uh, productive project. So let's get started. Uh, Jeff uh, gave me a glowing uh, introduction. I kind of like to meet that guy. Uh, so I won't go through all that. Uh, I do have a little bit of experience in geothermal, but I certainly don't know it all. Uh, learning uh, daily, and uh, I know a lot of you guys out there uh, see you at the shows and conferences and such, and uh, look forward to, uh, to this time together today. Uh, I typically like to ask people in the industry, how did they get started in geothermal, whether they're engineers, MEPs, contractors, potential contractors, uh, maybe they've started with a, uh, a small uh, vertical horizontal geothermal project, a pond loop, something like that. Uh, but as Jeff mentioned, um, I took a different route. Um, I started with uh, Ball State University, which to my knowledge is still the largest continuous geothermal project ever attempted in the United States. Uh, what makes this project different uh, is that they have uh, about 40 plus buildings on a 660 acre campus. And these buildings are all interconnected uh, via two district energy stations and they can pull heat out of a dorm room and pump it into an office space or out of a data center and uh, into an office and different things like that. So really unique, um, one of a kind system and it is being emulated on campuses and uh, projects around the country. Just a little bit about that project, won't go real deep. It's a 660 acre campus, uh, it's a 22 acre drill site, uh, drilled 1800 bores as the first phase. Each of those was 400 foot deep, it had a pair of one inch loops. Um, had uh, roughly eight drilling companies on site at any given time. 12 plus drill rigs, 50 plus uh, drillers and helpers, loop installers. Uh, so it was, it was quite a lot to orchestrate. Uh, the project now has approximately 5,000 boreholes on campus and it was completed over uh, three phases of construction lasting about six years. So what are we doing here today? What are our learning objectives? There are three uh, types of geothermal applications steps in the, in the GHX installation process. Uh, if you're not familiar with the GHX term as just uh, an acronym for a ground heat exchanger, um, and that is exactly what the geothermal process does. And then I've also included uh, at the end of this um, a pretty detailed outline of the steps uh, before, during, and after, an abstract, if you will, uh, to help ensure a safe and efficient loop program. And so uh, I'll also be uh, giving you my contact information at the end of this presentation. And if that's uh, something you'd like a copy of or more information about or like to discuss, I would certainly be happy to do so. So we'll get right into it. Um, types of geothermal heat exchange applications. Uh, and there are four primary and I'll go through those just uh, here briefly and then uh, a little bit more in detail. Uh, the first three are uh, under the closed loop uh, variety uh, and those can be installed in a vertical application and it is as the name suggests, it is a vertical geothermal heat exchanger uh, typically drilled with a, uh, a track rig, a uh, truck mounted rig. There are a variety of options. Uh, second, we have a horizontal application and there again, there's a numerous means and methods by which those can be installed uh, with the horizontal directional drilling equipment. It can be open cut uh, trenches. It can be uh, mass excavation. Uh, there is quite a variety of, of applications under the horizontal header. And then thirdly, we have a pond or lake loop uh, application uh, that can incorporate coils, slinky loops, 
Um, it can also uh, incorporate uh, plate heat exchangers, which is becoming more popular. So there are many types and configurations for each of these types. Uh, beyond that, we have something called open loop systems. Uh, and that is uh, a method by which water is extracted from the earth. It is run into a building or a facility. Uh, that water is uh, run through a piece of equipment in which the heat transfer takes place. And then that water is subsequently discharged either to a return well, uh, an open trench, uh, pond, loop, lake, stream, something of that nature. Again, uh, a variety of options and means and methods for that as well. And then lastly, it would be a hybrid system. Uh, hybrid systems can be uh, really a, a, a wide combination of things. A hybrid system that could be a combination of two of the aforementioned vertical and horizontal, horizontal and pond loop. Uh, and we've done a number of each of those. Uh, hybrid systems can also include conventional geothermal methods, applications such as vertical and horizontal uh, with additional uh, equipment, uh, which can be cooling towers, it can be uh, boilers, uh, other, other equipment to aid and facilitate uh, the life and the efficiency of those systems. So those are the basic applications and uh, I'll just talk here a little bit about each of those. Uh, vertical loop uh, is what I have most experience with. That's what the Ball State project was and what I've primarily, primarily done in my career in the Midwest. Uh, we have combined those with numerous other contractors, trades, and applications to, to uh, install hybrid systems. But vertical is, is typically the most common, uh, has the, uh, the smallest area footprint required. Uh, the loops are installed vertically. Uh, thus utilizing uh, less real estate. Uh, they can be installed in virtually any kind of uh, subsurface uh, strata formation, be it overburden, a variety of soils, bedrock, granite, limestone. Uh, there are means and methods to accomplish any of those. Uh, configurable to most any uh, project site. Uh, vertical drilling is uh, I like to say it, it, it's kind of the Cadillac of the geothermal system in that it has, uh, it has the same price tag, uh, or excuse me, has a larger price tag. Uh, it, it'll net you the same results. You can, you can get somewhere in a Ford or Chevy just fine. Uh, Cadillac just uh, does it with, a, with a, a little more flair and a little more cost, I guess. But uh, any of these are cost dependent based on uh, the building needs, the site, uh, survey, application, location, geology, all those things. Uh, one thing I do want to mention about a uh, vertical system, uh, the, the loops are drilled vertically and then they are tied in, they are interconnected horizontally uh, back to the building. And I don't know if you can see my cursor on this screen here, but in this scenario, we've got vertical loops in the ground and then we've got a horizontal tie-in running back to the building. That horizontal tie-in is not to be confused with a horizontal system, which we'll talk about in a moment, but uh, just like to make that distinction. So what do we mean by a vertical loop? Vertical loops are uh, really uh, evolved. Uh, and they are quite an amazing piece of equipment. Uh, they are available in a variety of sizes, three quarter, one inch, inch and a quarter, inch and a half. Uh, industry has recently come out with two inch loops, which are being uh, more, utili more utilized uh, in much deeper, larger diameter, higher capacity uh, projects. Um, but uh, these are available for purchase from numerous manufacturers. You can buy them in any size. You can buy these legs in any length uh, as the project requires. Uh, moving on to, uh, this would be an architectural rendering of a, uh, a geothermal borehole configuration. This is literally pulled off a set of plans and specs. Uh, what this will tell the contractors is exactly what the architect and engineer are looking for. You've got a supply pipe, you've got a U-bend, you've got a return pipe. Uh, this application requires a one-inch uh, polyethylene uh, loop. 
the red kind of depicts what the borehole looks like. Over here, you've got a minimum berry depth. Uh, over here on the left, it talks about sand bedding the pipe. And this is done for uh, insulating purposes, but also uh, primarily for any jagged material for protection of the pipe. That sand bedding will, uh, as that pipe heat expands and contracts as the thermal transfer occurs, we don't want rock or anything sharp uh, pressing up against that over time. It has the potential to, uh, to puncture a loop. Uh, I will add a note here that uh, I've been doing this for a little over 15 years. And to my knowledge, we do not have a single loop that was properly tested, installed, tested again, uh, and, uh, and put into operation that has failed without intervention from some sort of outside source, someone digging into it or something of that nature. So kind of a nice uh, depiction here of, of what a loop looks like. Uh, another thing I want to add to in a vertical application, uh, typically you're drilling uh, into depths from 150, 6, 800 feet deep in the earth. And almost invariably, you're going to run into a static table, a water table uh, in this formation. So when you try to insert a plastic pipe into a body of water, being this borehole, um, there is a natural propensity for the pipe to want to float out of the hole. So oftentimes uh, a steel rod uh, will be affixed, uh, either hung below or affixed to the loop itself. Uh, can be 100 pounds, 200 pounds, depending on the size, weight, uh, the type of drilling that's occurred. But that weight will help uh, counteract the buoyancy of that plastic pipe, get it to the bottom of the borehole and keep it there until it can be grouted and the grout sets up, kind of sand locks the, uh, the loop in place. A uh, photo on the right is an out ungrouted borehole uh, with a single inch and a quarter loop. Uh, at this point, a trimming line would be in inserted into the, to the borehole. Uh, sometimes they elect to send the trimming down with the loop, sometimes after. Uh, there again, it's a means and methods. Um, but I also want to share a distinction here. There is a significant difference between a borehole and a well. Uh, the term well is used uh, quite frequently in our industry. Uh, it was, it's seen both in writing, it is used verbally, um, and a well is simply a hole in the, in the earth, which typically would have a, some sort of a pumping mechanism to uh, withdraw or return water to the earth. A borehole doesn't do that. A borehole simply is a, a vacated column that a loop can be set in, uh, thermally enhanced grout added, uh, and then backfilled over the top of. And the reason that this is important and the lesson that we learned at Ball State, um, counties, uh, municipalities, um, cities, they, they have different ordinances and that's always something needs to be checked. When the plans and specs came out for Ball State, there was, uh, they were referred to as wells. There was 1800 of them on phase one, 400 foot deep. So when the general contractor went to the, uh, the county health department to get their building permits, the county building department said, okay, great, you've got uh, 1,800 wells. We charge $50 a piece. So uh, we'll be needing a check for $90,000 to permit phase one of this project. And so the GC quickly uh, sat back and said, hey, no, nah, ag, you know, this is not really a well, it's a borehole, there's a distinction. Um, so, yeah, it may be semantics, but the nomenclature can be important. So uh, anytime that you're putting that in writing, plans and specs, um, reading that, it's important to know if that is a well or a borehole. So there's my little spiel on that. Uh, photo on the, on the left then, just an example of a, a U-bend, uh, and we'll see some more of those. Uh, once the borehole is drilled and the loop has been set, then uh, the contractor would install a trimmy pipe, which is typically uh, an inch and a half, two inch coil of pipe. Uh, it is on a reel. It will uh, be at least, that coil will be at least the full depth of that borehole. So if you have a 500 foot borehole, 
you might have a 550, a 600 foot coil of two inch pipe on a reel. And that pipe is hooked to a uh, router. Router is very much like a cement mixer in which the contractor would uh, then mix the specified grout material. We'll talk a little bit about that as well. Um, but that grout material would then be pumped from the surface down to the bottom of the borehole. And as you can see in this illustration, it begins to fill all the cracks and crevices, uh, the complete annulus, the space between the loop and the bore wall itself. Um, typically about 30 minutes, give or take, uh, is required to fill a nominal six inch borehole uh, at a 500 foot depth. There again, it depends on equipment, type of grout being used, operator, site conditions, number of factors. Uh, there are multitude of uh, really good grout manufacturers out there, and uh, and there's a wide range of, of, of costs. Uh, typically, anywhere from fifty cents to two dollars a foot uh, can be the material cost for grouting. Again, it depends on size of the borehole, number of loops, um, type of drilling, rock formations, fractures. There's a lot of variables, uh, and that and that price does not include labor and equipment. So it is a uh, it is a, an expensive part of the process. Uh, those costs can really add up. If you're paying two dollars a foot on a 500 foot hole, that's thousand dollars in grout plus the labor and equipment to install it. So certainly something you would you would take into consideration uh, as you're bidding a project. So in short, grout is a very expensive component, but it's it's very necessary. I like to uh, I like to equate grout. I say grout is uh, grout is to geothermal what wire is to electricity. Grout is the means and methods by what it, by which the heat transfer takes place. Without that, we would not have the efficient thermal conductivity from the fluid inside the loops through the grout into and out of the earth. So really it's, it's something that's often uh, not highly focused on, but it is absolutely a, uh, a key element of, of, of the process. One more note that I will make is that um, grout types and placement methods can vary by state, by jurisdiction. So make sure that you are aware and check with um, local entities making sure, I give you an instance uh, down in Kentucky, there are places they're still using gravel grout, uh, which pea gravel is washed into a hole and uh, perhaps a bentonite cap is placed on top or a concrete cap. Uh, there are places up uh, in the extreme uh, northern part of the, the country that, uh, that are using cementous grout, at least have been. I'm not sure if that's still the case, but um, so important to know what grouts are and aren't allowed in any given area. So that's my spiel on grouting. Uh, this is an example of a uh, bore field layout, something you'd see in a set of plans and specs. Uh, this particular uh, project is uh, reflective of a 200 hole bore field design. Uh, each one of these dots is uh, representative of an individual loop. Uh, the lines running parallel to those would be the supply and return lines. Each one of these would be a circuit. They may be back, run back individually. In this case, it appears that they are on uh, central supply and return lines and run into a vault. Those lines are collective and then into larger supply and return lines to the building. So there are just a limitless uh, number of options, variations. We've done projects where we drilled one loop outside of every classroom on a school building. Uh, we've done these where we have peppered loops uh, all around, say in green spaces on uh, tree lawns and, and landscape islands and parking lots. So it does not have to look like this uh, nice, even rectangular presentation. Uh, there are a, a wide range of of options and varieties for, for laying these out.
I chose this example here. This is a YMCA project we did a couple of years ago, uh, Shelbyville, Indiana, uh, near Indianapolis. I kind of like this photo uh, for the simple reason. If you look back at the bore field, everything is perfect and uniform and your spacing is 20 foot on center and it's nice and clean and looks good. Life is not, uh, doesn't always imitate art for sure, but so a bore field, uh, in, in theory, yes, your loops would be exactly 20 foot on center, uh, both east and west, north and south. But the reality is that is not how contracting works, unfortunately. Um, due to maneuvering 50, 60,000 pound drill rigs in a muddy uh, bore field, um, due to deep earth uh, formations, oftentimes we'll set up a rig and, and start drilling and may only get 10, 20, 30, 50 feet down, uh, encounter some kind of a fracture, a boulder, some sort of obstacle that uh, challenges the, the uh, production drilling. And so we'll have to move five feet and, uh, and start the hole over again. So this is a relatively good example. These loops here are somewhat in a, in a straight row, uh, but they're certainly not perfect. Uh, the people drilling them aren't perfect and they, the end result's not perfect, uh, but it does get the job done. After those holes were uh, drilled, dropped and grouted, uh, the drilling contractor typically moves off site and a tie-in or excavation uh, contractor uh, will come in. And from that process, uh, they will repressure check all the loops, make sure everything is, is uh, fully pressurized, no leaks exist. From that point, they will start excavating typically a 60 inch trench, but there again, that can uh, depend on plans and specs. Uh, circuits can be fused either in the trench or at grade, as they're doing in this example here. They're taking stick pipe, which is available in 20, 40, 50 foot lengths, and they will cut and fuse and put their supply and return, saddle fusions, butt fusions uh, in place. They can do that and then drop the, uh, the horizontal piping into the trench, or they can do it all in the trench. So another means and methods. Uh, obviously, you've got open excavations on these projects. Uh, typically, the entire uh, bore field will be left as an open excavation. You can see an example here where they've got an open excavation that's already been tied in. Uh, they've put up some caution tape through here. The site is also fenced off. So OSHA excavation rules and regulations absolutely apply. Uh, there is certainly a potential hazard there. Uh, again, there are a number of companies, uh, both locally and, and nationally, that specialize in this. Some drilling companies will do their own. Uh, many will, will hire this service done and uh, move their rigs on to the next project. So once the holes are, uh, the vertical holes are drilled and uh, our tie-in contractor has come in, uh, they, this is an example of a, uh, an excavated trench. Uh, you can see here that each of these loop tails, as we call them, there's a pair here, a pair here, a pair here. Each of these are run to a supply and or return line. Uh, and it really doesn't matter because you go down one side and back up the other. Um, so as long as you have one each per circuit per loop, you're in good shape. Uh, the third pipe here is an example of a reverse return. And this is a method by which uh, we keep uh, loop temperatures and loop pressures the same, flow rates. Um, it is pretty common in the industry and, uh, and frequently spec'd. Once these uh, individual loops are tied into circuit piping, that circuit piping then would be run uh, either to a building or to a vault. We'll talk a little bit about vaults here in a minute. Um, next slide, if I can get the right button. Next slide shows this particular application did not utilize an exterior vault. Uh, this is not part of the geothermal system. Uh, in, in this case, we had 140 loops. There were 14 circuits of 10 loops a piece. And so the contractor was hired and uh, the design was to run each of these circuits into the building and have an interior header manifold. 
on this particular project, I actually made a two layer raft of six inch PVC pipe, about six foot long. And each of these three inch lines that you see here, in this case, these are the supply lines, uh, buried about uh, a foot or so below this are the return lines and it mirrors exactly what this looks like. So from each of the 14 circuits of 10 loops, each of those are run in a graduating larger size pipe from inch and a quarter, inch and a half, two inch, three inch, and they're run into the building. Uh, in this application, we had the advantage of putting this raft in. We drilled the entire bore field uh, and started a uh, horizontal tie-in before the structure was even started. So we put those PVC conduits in uh, in order to uh, get our work done so we could demobilize and uh, get out of the way of other construction activities. And they literally built the building right over the top of it. Once the uh, circuits are installed and your horizontal piping is done, uh, two things are, are really uh, important um, for future identification of these lines. Uh, that's tracer wire and tracer tape, uh, typically the spec on all commercial projects and quite honestly, something we did on all our residential projects as well. Um, about a 10 inch, or excuse me, 10 gauge copper wire would be zip tied to each of the uh, copper lines, the circuits, if you will, as they're coming from the individual boreholes across the field and to the building. And those are used uh, with tracer equipment for later identification. And then as a secondary measure of protection, uh, we would put foil geothermal marked tracer tape directly over each and every line in the trench. So, uh, you know, class of 1983 is uh, dedicating a tree at their local high school and uh, they commence to digging and somebody pulls up this foil tape, this is geothermal below, and we certainly hope they have enough common sense to uh, move and uh, change the location of that tree installation. So this tracer tape is uh, typically put 18 to 24 inches below grade. And again, it's an early warning measure uh, directly over the HDPE pipe. So we talked uh, quite a bit about vertical loops and the tie-in. Uh, here's an example of a horizontal loop. And there are probably more examples, means and methods of doing horizontal applications than any other. Uh, these can be done in a host of configurations. Um, they do typically take up uh, more real estate, uh, but your equipment to install is uh, vastly less expensive be done with a dozer, a backhoe, a trencher, um, you know, at the cost of a couple hundred thousand dollars versus a drill rig at a million plus. So you're at shallower depths, uh, you still get the heat transfer. Uh, there, it's a great alternative, a great option uh, application uh, and can be done in a, in a host of, of different methods. Here we see a, uh, some linear pipe run in a horizontal trench uh, looks here like this application is about four to five foot deep. Uh, looks like they've done some strip excavation and banked the, uh, the banks back uh, for trenching safety. Uh, once those are pipes are all installed, uh, filled, pressure tested, uh, witness signed off, then the, uh, the contractor will come back and uh, they'll install their tracer wire. They'll start the backfill process, install tracer tape, and then finish, uh, finish the backfill. Um, this right here is a depiction of another form of uh, horizontal application. Uh, in this case, they strip, simply uh, did a strip excavation of the site. And each of these, uh, we call them slinkies. They are coils of pipe. Each one of these, it's kind of a pigtail that's interconnected. So each one of these long runs would be an individual circuit. And those would be hooked up virtually the same as a vertical loop field. There would be a supply and return to each of those. Um, same premise, uh, it is installed, tested, uh, tracer wire is attached. Uh, they start the backfill, tracer tape. Uh, obviously pressure testing is another 
key component, um, but just another means and methods. Uh, the last of the closed loop methods I'm going to talk about are the pond or lake loops. And uh, these have been around for millennia, I believe. Uh, average is about three to 400 foot of polyethylene pipe per ton. Uh, may depend on the part of the country and peak loads and uh, how the engineer uh, determines uh, what the project requirements are. Uh, these coils are set in a, in a pond. Typically, they're floated out. You can see, you'll see in the next slide, but uh, these coils will have spacers in between to allow the water to uh, flow in between the, uh, the individual coils and uh, thus giving better heat transfer. Uh, typically, these coils are uh, floated out. Here's, a, here's an application here where they're building rafts in each one of these individual coils has a supply and return line already attached to it. So they will take those out to a uh, desired location. Uh, typically their cinder blocks or some type of weight is added. So once they get them in position and the loops are filled uh, with water or heat transfer fluid, uh, then those blocks will help take and secure those loops to the bottom of a pond. Uh, this photograph on the right is a uh, obviously a uh, a much larger application, but it just gives the scalability here. You can do uh, a single uh, loop, uh, a coil, a raft of loops, uh, or you can do something of a much larger nature. Uh, something I like to tell my residential clients, uh, it is always best to have uh, some sort of a written contract, lease agreement, uh, permission to use a, a body of water. Maybe you're on a community lake or something. Um, I would hate to uh, see someone install a, a project like this and then find out they, uh, they're either going to drain the lake uh, you know, annually or, or they don't have permission to be there. So just a minor detail, but can save some headache down the road. This is an application uh, just recently obtained this photograph. Uh, this was a, a residential pond loop project uh, going in down near Macon, Georgia. Uh, you can see on here that there's a white PVC framework that's been uh, installed. The loops have been uh, zip tied. There are spacers between the coils. And uh, this, is, this one's kind of interesting. Uh, this is a, uh, a very highly used uh, fishing area. You can see the boat uh, launch here on either side. And so the contractor, in an effort to uh, keep from having fish hooks penetrate this loop in the pond, they put a sacrificial snow fence on top of this. And uh, the theory here is if it gets snagged by a hook, they'll, uh, they'll hook into the snow fence and, and not into the loop itself. Uh, here's an example of a, uh, a pond loop that I'm familiar with. Uh, this is Water Furnace's uh, office and manufacturing facility in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Uh, Mr. McGowan, who I believe is on the call, installed this uh, a few years ago, um, 2016, I believe. Uh, initial layout for this was about 400 tons. Uh, idea here on a three and a half acre pond that's roughly seven to eight feet deep uh, that is going to heat and cool our entire office facility and our manufacturing facility. And it has done so for uh, nearly a decade. Uh, just recently, we have added to that system. This is a couple of photographs, some sonar imagery. Uh, what you're looking is a top-down view. This is our office space here. This is our uh, manufacturing facility for the uh, commercial residential water furnace equipment. Um, our initial pond uh, had 400 tons of heating cooling capacity which uh, took care of the office and manufacturing and labs that we had at the time. We have uh, the demand in the industry. We have opted to expand our facility. Uh, we're going from roughly 130,000 square feet and we're adding another 140,000 square feet of additional manufacturing capacity. Uh, we've also added a number of uh, test labs and we are able to uh, heat and cool 
seven labs to max capacity uh, at any time of year. So we went ahead and doubled the, uh, the capacity of that pond, still using that same three and a half acre, seven foot deep pond. And you can sort of see the, uh, the addition of some of these uh, new loops that were added uh, here a couple of years ago. And uh, so great, efficient, cost-effective way to put a closed loop dethermal in. Lastly, I'll just mention plate heat exchangers, uh, very much like uh, a pond loop. It is a pond loop, very much like a, a coil loop. Um, however, if you are in an environment that is uh, beaver rich, if there are uh, an abundance of, of, of beavers uh, in and near the pond where you're planning on, on putting that, a plate heat exchanger can be a, a really good alternative. Uh, beavers have been known to mistake uh, HDPE pipe for uh, some sort of a submerged branch or limb, uh, and it is absolutely no problem for them to chew right through it. And uh, so that'll certainly wreak havoc on, on any pond loop system. So another alternative um, and uh, more expensive due to material costs, typically made out of stainless or titanium, but have a very quick install time long life span and uh, highly effective. Just want to talk just a little bit about HDPE pipe. Uh, we would make the note that everything in an HDPE bore field, be it vertical, horizontal, pond loop, it is the same material. It's a 4710 resin that's been used for about a decade now. Uh, it was an upgrade and an improvement over the prior version. A slightly thinner wall of pipe, but it is the same material for loops, fittings, vaults. Um, they make valves, they make a, a number of components. Uh, extremely durable. Uh, industry testing has uh, indicated that the half life of 4710 resin pipe is 200 years. The manufacturers readily uh, provide 50 year warranties on this pipe. Um, myself personally, I've got loops that are in excess of 15 years old, still in operation. Uh, I know of contractors who have put pipe in uh, in the late 70s, still in full operation. I just want to talk briefly about uh, a couple of the uh, the fusion, the process itself, and the, and the fittings that are available. And again, there's a wide range of those. Uh, I like to say that there are four types of fusion. Uh, there are butt fusion, which literally is uh, two pieces of pipe that are sheared and melted together. Uh, up here, you can see there is a uh, something called a bulldog. Uh, this is a piece of equipment that would be used to uh, insert uh, stick pipe from both sides can be anywhere from three quarter inch all the way up to 72 inch. Uh, the uh, smaller smaller pieces, two inches under, can be done on a handheld machine. Uh, anything over two inches is typically done on a McElroy or other type of specific equipment designed for that. You may have seen these in the, in the gas, water well, a variety of industries use these. So butt fusion is, is two pieces of pipe literally butted together end to end. Uh, socket fusion is, as the name suggests, it is a socket that uh, can either be uh, connect two pieces of HDPE pipe in a variety of sizes. They come in 90s and Ts, new bends and Ys. Uh, there is a host of, uh, of fittings available in various sizes and, and uh, pipe size ratings. Uh, a lot of these smaller ones are just done with handheld tools. Uh, this is an example of a fusion paddle. A paddle would heat up to anywhere from 475 to over 500 degrees. There is a certain uh, hold time when you're melting or fusing the pipe together. There's a certain hold time once the fusion is done. There's a certain setup time, but charts and, and uh, are available for all those. Uh, very simple to do. Uh, but also critical that it's done properly, that the pipe is kept clean at all times. Another option would be electrofusion. Uh, these are a little more expensive fittings. Uh, they are run by a, a fusion uh, machine. 
These are great for overhead applications, uh, repair applications, uh, perhaps somewhere you don't have the room to get a, a bulldog or a fusion paddle, uh, say into an overhead, whereas the, uh, the pipe can be cut an electrofusion uh, fitting can be inserted. Uh, leads are attached to the sides of these electrofusions. The parameters are entered into the machine and uh, it will actually fuse that pipe together, disconnect the leads, allow it to cure, and you move on. So those are butt fusion, socket fusion, and electrofusion. And uh, if you don't plan and execute your projects correctly, you are liable to have confusion. So not my joke, but I, uh, but I stole it uh, from a, a friend of mine down in Oklahoma and uh, just thought I'd share that with you. So anyway, a little bit about the fusion process and available fittings. Uh, here we have vaults. We are... We have a variety of vaults available uh, from HDPE vaults, concrete, and they come in a variety of sizes, can be custom ordered depending on the needs of the project. I'm just looking at my clock here and realizing we're, uh, we're burning through time here pretty quick. So I'm going to speed this up just a little bit. My apologies. Um, another example there's an HDPE vault just shipped in, ready to be placed. There are also uh, concrete vaults uh, that have been used for years. I think they're being replaced uh, pretty extensively with HDPE, but uh, they're certainly an option and there are applications. A vault really is nothing more than an exterior mechanical room. Um, Spline return lines, uh, be it from a vault or uh, from a, uh, an exterior header system, supply and return lines are, are simply the largest lines in the system, and they do just that. They supply uh, fluid to the bore field and return it once the heat transfer has been done. Uh, last thing I'll talk about here real quick is flushing and purging on any type of system, uh, any type of closed loop system. Uh, filling, flushing, and purging the system is critical. And uh, there is a, a host of information and contractors available to do that. And uh, it is just a critical step in ensuring that the system is clean, pressurized, and purged of any air. Uh, you've got a little bit of sand in your system, and that continues to cycle through there. Sand is very abrasive uh, and uh, certainly can wreak havoc on your, on your system. Hybrid systems we talked about earlier, they're a combination of a variety of, of uh, closed loop, open loop. Here we have a campus community or district system and uh, thermal energy network. And I just show this to say that most anything is possible. You can utilize pond loops, vertical loops, single pipe, um, solar equipment, wind. These, these district energy systems are certainly becoming more and more popular and have uh, more and more momentum behind them. Uh, just mentioned thermal conductivity testing. If you're on the design phase of a project, uh, that is really critical to, uh, to be able to know what the formation is in the given area and uh, the thermal conductivity of the ground, deep earth temperature, all those things. Another aspect of that is having a, uh, a driller's well log. And uh, that is critical to know what the formation is and will ultimately help you reduce the price of the project by allowing the contractors to know what the conditions are on a given site. A little bit about the uh, installation process. Uh, there again, this is a lot to go through, um, but uh, do wanna be able to uh, share this information. So. Afraid I'm running out of time here a little bit, Jeff, but um, I'm going to just jump ahead just real quick. I just want to uh, let you guys know that there is a before, during, and after uh, job site assessment, um, all the steps that are necessary uh, for the pre planning, the execution, and the wrap up of uh, any given geothermal project. Uh, on a commercial project, a site specific safety plan is is really a, a critical uh, tool. Uh, it can save lives, money, and time. 
and something I can share with you if uh, you'd like to reach out. Uh, I also can't stress enough taking site photos before, during, and after every single project that you do. Um, people's memories fade, uh, pictures typically do not. So with a time state stamp, they, stamp, they can uh, uh, they hold up well in the court if you have to. Um, schedules, uh, site conditions, plans and specs, there's just a lot of considerations on the, uh, on the forefront of any of these projects. Uh, I'll run through there just a little bit. Here again, a list of uh, several things. And a lot of these steps are done before, during, and after. So a site-specific safety plan is not a one-time thing. It's, it's a living document that you use during the course of the project. Toolbox talks, again, site photos, mobilization plans, quality inspections, Best practices, uh, always uh, recommended. Crop sampling, another important aspect, even if it's not required, uh, it adds some credibility to your work and some insurance that you've done it correctly. Uh, pressure testing, uh, very important at every phase of the project. Fill, flush, and purge, again, critical to a successful project. Uh, we mentioned vaults a little bit, and uh, those are an option if uh, mechanical space is at a, at, a, at a premium and unavailable. Uh, a few steps after the project. Um, certainly, uh, again, some of these are repeated. As-built drawings, O&Ms, site photos, state well logs, grout reports. All these things are critical to give the owner, the client, the information they need to what's been done, how it's been done. Uh, where pipes are located, loops, circuits, faults, those types of things. Uh, and of course, invoicing, that's why we're doing this, right? So I have gone through that rather quickly, but I'm uh, gonna reach out for some questions, Jeff. Great presentation, I uh, really appreciate that, Kevin. Uh, it is 11.29 Central Time. Do you have time to stick around for questions? A absolutely, absolutely. I'm Apologize for running over. Not at all. I think we could have gone another uh, another hour or two, and and we would have would have still had uh, some additional material. So it's good stuff. All right. Uh, I want to be respectful of everyone's time. Uh, it has been uh, an hour, but if you would like to stick around and listen to the questions, uh, feel free. We'll we'll stick on the line as as long as Kevin has time. Uh, before we get started, I want to thank you and and Jared mentioned this as well uh, for defining. A bore versus a well, boy, that's uh, super important to our industry. So thank you very much. Um, the first question comes from Larry. He asks for your stance on grouting directional bore uh, ground heat exchangers. Uh, I certainly recommend it. I don't know that it's a common practice. Uh, there are different schools of thought. And I think some of that is based on the formation that people are directional drilling in. Um, if you look at the expert manual, uh, it is it is certainly uh, called out to be done, and I think a lot of contractors do it. Sometimes it's it's omitted, but yes, absolutely. Uh, I think it it both protects the pipe, it helps the conductivity process, the thermal heat transfer, and absolutely is my recommendation to grow. Very good, thank you, Kevin. Uh, Brock wants to call out it's National Safety Stand Down Week for evacuations, so uh, that's a that's a good note. Yes, thanks, Rob. Um, Victor has a question. Which design guidelines or resources do you recommend for evaluation of ponds or lakes for ground heat exchanger applications? For example, water volume and or depth required um, based on load. Uh, there's a real simple formula that says a pond seven to eight foot deep that is greater than or equal to the size of the space that you're conditioning. That's just a real general rule of thumb. But if uh, if you want to reach out to my uh, my email address listed here, show me here, uh, I'd be happy to uh, to get you some of that technical information and some really good websites. Okay, thank you, Kevin. Absolutely. Uh, Victor asks another question here regarding fusion techniques. Is one recommended over another for base commercial ground heat exchanger uh, installation specs? Uh, not necessarily one over another. They all have their, their, their purposes. Uh, typically, uh, socket fusion is, is just on small diameter pipe. 
Uh, it's easier to, in a lot of applications, to socket fuse a three quarter inch uh, poly pipe or two of them together. Uh, and the larger pipe uh, butt fusion, uh, just because of uh, how to handle, how to, how to shear and melt and fuse and handle the equipment. So both have their place in application. Electric fusion is, is certainly the least used. Um, it's the most expensive, but it absolutely has a place. So kind of like uh, three different tools in the toolbox. Excellent. All right. Uh, Paul asked the question, is pipe buildup or corrosion a common problem with open loop systems? It certainly can be, and, uh, and that is a good question. Uh, anytime an open loop is being considered, uh, I think water quality is the number one concern, um, both from a supply side, uh, the quality of the water itself, iron bacteria has a propensity to build up, uh, especially in a turbulent, turbulent flow application. If it gets oxidized, it'll grow even faster. Uh, typically, we see open loops that fail. They fail on the discharge line side. So again, um, feel free to reach out. Uh, I'd love to further that conversation. But yeah. Great. Thank you. All right. Sean asked a question about pressure testing. What's the best method to pressure test a loop? What pressure and what time frame? Uh, that can be um, spec dependent. Uh, we've seen everything from 100 PSI for 30 minutes to up to 24 hours of uh, pressure testing. So it really depends on what the engineer calls for. Uh, in our experience, uh, an absolute minimum would be 100 PSI for 30 minutes uh, with, uh, without the loss of more than one pound. Okay. I believe that's in the standard as well. The yes, sir. I believe it is. Financial standard. Uh, there are a couple comments here on pond loops. Uh, Steve and Tom uh, have some comments here. Steve mentions pond loops typically require a depth of 10 to 12 feet. Uh, typical pond design is 300 foot of pipe per ton. However, Dr. Cavanaugh has a grad student do testing on pond loops and a 400 foot coil adds a few degrees to the loop temp. Similarly, uh, Tom references uh, Dr. Cavanaugh's ASHRAE publication. And I, I, I uh, have spent quite a bit of time in that book. So it does have a great uh, design section on uh, on pond loops. Uh, Terry mentions great presentation, uh, regardless uh, if laymen, contractors, engineers, politicians, et cetera. And uh, then we have another comment here from Steve about hydrostatically testing loops, increasing the pressure to 120 PSI till we can hold that pressure, at which point we drop to 100 PSI. The loop will typically hold the 100 PSI for 24 hours. There is an ASTM standard F2164 on that as well, which is a great reference. Good point. Thanks, Steve. And Mark has a question about uh, biofouling for pond loops. How big of a problem is that, Kevin? Well, the pond loop, if I understand the question, the biofouling, um, is, is a non-issue if that is a closed loop circuit and uh, it, it, it wouldn't really be any difference than burying that in the ground. You're burying it in a pond. Okay. Maybe I'm not understanding the question. Yeah, I'm not, not sure exactly. And maybe it's the uh, fouling of the external the pipe. I'm not positive. Um, if well, Mark would send me an email, I'd love, to, I'd love to discuss that further with him. Very good, very good, thank you. And one last question here we have sure. from Elizabeth. Do you have any recommended grouters and trimming pipes? I want to rent one and our rental supply house did not know what I was talking about uh, with the supply return HDP, HDPE pipe. How long do you have to dig on the trencher to get the building or house before you cover the pipes with dirt plus the distance from the building, please? So we have several questions here. I guess the first sure. one is uh, grouters and trimming pipes. Um, if you have any recommendations there. You know, I, I'd like to talk to her more about the specific project. Uh, and, and if it's not something they've done in the, in the past, maybe it's a good idea to hire a contractor and then observe. Uh, but but the, the specifics of an individual project may dictate what type of grouter, what type of grout. Um, and, uh, but yeah, there again, love to, love to have that one-on-one -on -one conversation and, and reach out. Uh, Geolope makes a grouter. That there's, a, there's a host of different uh, grout manufacturers, grout lines are typically the same 4710 resin uh, that are the loops and the, uh, and the, and the uh, circuit piping and so forth. 
Perfect. Well, thanks for staying later. Um, Absolutely. Yes, Kevin. Uh, Mark uh, here, here clarifies that he's talking about external fouling. Let's maybe uh, take that question and then uh, then we probably ought to call it a day. Um, there again, I'm not entirely sure uh, where he's going with that. I don't know if he's talking about just build up on top of the loop uh, in the bottom of a pond, silt, and those types of things. Uh, and my understanding that is typically not an issue. Um, but, um, uh, you know, Steve McGowan's done, uh, done a host of, of pond loops and he may actually be a better resource for that, but, but happy to continue that conversation. Okay. All right. Well, Kevin's email is on the screen and, uh, you know, feel free to, to shoot a message to him. Thanks again for the presentation. Very informative. Certainly. Certainly. Thank you everyone on the call for joining us. Uh, this will be, um, uploaded to the website and you'll, you'll find it if you go to igspa.org. There's a YouTube icon at the very top. It should be there by midweek uh, next week. And uh, thanks again. Watch our events and training calendar, and, and you'll see more of these great presentations. Have a great weekend. Thanks so much, everyone. See you. Thanks, Jeff.